your father. There is a beast beneath the boards. Oh, my dearest love. Hi, this is Simon Canlish and welcome to another marvellous video. When you are asked the question, what is the most powerful weapon that the Targaryens have in their arsenal, you almost feel like scoffing at it, because the answer is so obvious, right? Daemon Targaryen says as much to his wife Rhaenyra in episode 10 of House of the Dragon, that dreams did not make us kings, dragons did. But we would like to make the case that the former is a far more powerful ally for the Dragon Lords of Westeros. For the dreams of a Targaryen often tend to speak of the future. We got a notion of this with King Viserys when he spoke of his air dreams, but nowhere has this been more clearer than with Queen Helena Targaryen, the seemingly timid entomologist of the family. She was brought to our notice as a simple-minded girl with prophetic ramblings, but her role will be far more expansive and far more tragic going forward as the Dance of the Dragons approaches. So without further ado, this is Queen Helena Targaryen's origins, explored. And spoiler warning because there will be a lot of these in this video. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, and let's begin. You will have a dragon one day. You'll have to close an eye. I know it. They breathe and dreams songs of dragons, the prophetic powers of the dragon lords. Barristan Selmy once told the nearest Targaryen that according to King Jaehaerys II, every time a Targaryen is born, the gods toss a coin and the world holds its breath to see whether the babe will show greatness or madness. Most accounts of Targaryens and indeed all dragon lords of Valeria acknowledge the fact that the blood of the dragon had within it the propensity to spread the taint of insanity. This was considered to be the result of thousands of years of inbreeding, in case you had forgotten. The Dragon Lords of Westeros had fled to Dragonstone in wake of the appending doom, but their lineage was rooted in the Valarian Peninsula, meaning the Targaryens had been practicing incest far longer than the 300 years or so they spent ruling the Seven Kingdoms. But it was the ill-fated demise of their civilization that laid bare their more, shall we say, hidden powers, that announced to the world that fire and blood were not the only things that made the Valarians so powerful. They were also prophetic dreamers. Up until 12 years before the doom of Valeria, only the children of the forest, the green seers of the north and the warlocks of Quarth, had been known to have prophetic powers. Yes, the Valerian dragon lords had glass candles that could show them events far off in the distance, whether that distance be in terms of space or time, but you can't exactly call that an innate ability now, can you? In fact, it put them much closer to the warlocks, whose powers seem to be derived from the psychedelic drink called Shade of the Evening. But then Daenerys Targaryen had her dream, and everything changed. Remembered by antiquity, as Daenys, the dreamer, Aenor Targaryen's daughter, was the one who foresaw the doom of Valeria. And instead of dismissing his daughter's vision, Aenar put his full weight behind it. He sold all his holdings in Valeria and the lands of Long Summer and moved his family and dragons to Dragonstone, the westernmost trade outpost of the Dragon Lords of old. The Targaryen family's enemies in the Freehold took their flight as a sign of cowardice, believing that they were fleeing their homeland instead of heeding a warning. Those people would end up being proven fatally wrong when the 14 flames erupted on that fateful day and drowned the skies over the Valyrian Peninsula with fire and blood. No one who was present there survived, and thereafter the lands of the Freehold were thought to be cursed, with the doom still ruling Valeria till this day. Aenar Targaryen and his family became the only remaining dragon lords in the known world, and his daughter was thereafter known as Daenys the Dreamer. She put down all her visions in a book called Signs and Portents, which is highly sought after in the main timeline. We do not know the history of the Targaryen dragon dreamers after their arrival to Westeros as intimately as we would like to, simply because they kept their secrets well. It is likely that when the House of the Dragon still had their mounts around to carry them over the skies, they also had dreamers. George R. R. Martin recently revealed that Aegon the Conqueror himself was a dragon dreamer and that his conquest of the Seven Kingdoms was based on a dream he 
he had seen of the second long night and the role his house's dragons would play in it. But apart from that, we don't know for sure if any of Aegon's predecessors or successors shared his prophetic burden. It is possible that Queen Visenya Targaryen was a dragon dreamer, for she is continually referred to in history as a practitioner of the dark arts. But she seems more blood mage than dreamy oracle. What we do know is that even after losing their dragons, the Targaryens did not lose their dreams, and the taints of madness started becoming stronger as well. In the Dunk and Egg novellus, we meet two dragon dreamers and hear of at least half of a dozen of them overall. The first is Prince Daeron the Drunk, who was scared of Dunk because he dreamed that a dragon would fall dead upon him and yet he would walk away unscathed. Daeron knew of the nature of dragon dreams and so he was terrified that Dunk was going to harm his family in some way, which contributed to his decisions leading up to the trial by seven. As fate would have it though, Daeron had completely misread his vision and the dragon he saw was Uncle Bela Breakspear, who died at the hands of his own teammates during the trial. With this limp body being the dragon he saw falling on Dunk, Damon Blackfire the second, aka John the Fiddler, accurately dreamt that Dunk would one day become Lord Commander of the King's Guard. He even dreamed about the death of his brothers, Aegon and Aemon, and also dreamt of a dragon's egg hatching at White Walls, which did come true after a fashion as well. But none of these things happened in the way that he thought they would. Dunk would become Lord Commander, yes, but for the King's Guard of his then Squire Prince Aegon Targaryen, whom ascended the throne as King Aegon V. Damon's dream about acquiring a dragon at White Walls was a misinterpretation as well, because it was there that Dunk Squire Egg stepped up as Prince Aegon of House Targaryen for the first time and assisted the Iron Throne in putting down the Second Blackfire Rebellion. Maester Aemon recalls to Sam in his final days that all his brothers dreamed of dragons and it took their lives. Daeron and Aegon V were his brothers and Aemon himself had been a dreamer, like all of his brothers. So prophetic dreams are intrinsically linked to the very psyche of a Targaryen and it is both a gift and a curse. More often than not, one will fail at interpreting their dreams correctly and obsessing over them has been known to drive Targaryens mad. The most prominent example of this would be Maester Aemon's brother other, Aeron. Aeron was a dreamer who, like his brothers, dreamed that dragons would return to the world someday. Determined to hasten the process, Prince Aeron drank a cup of wildfire, thinking that it would transform him into a dragon. Aeron had been considered to be mad even before that, and it was for striking him that Dunk was put on the trial by seven we mentioned earlier in the first place. It's possible that his vision showed him that wildfire would somehow be connected to the rise of a dragon, but as we all know from the main series, that is a sure sign of madness. And the thing is, Aeron was not the only one who became obsessed with the return of dragons to the point of madness. After the dance, which left the mighty mounts of the dragon lords extinct for a while, the theme of dragons' dreams shifted from warning about the end of dragons to hinting at their return. And the frequency with which we started hearing about dreamers themselves also increased. It's likely that King Ares II, the infamous Mad King, was a dragon dreamer whose inability to find the right answer to his dreams contributed to his madness. Recall that in his speech to Brienne about his decision to kill Aerys. Jaime states that the Mad King thought the wildfire would transform him into a dragon that would rise from the ashes to burn his enemies to death. This sounds a lot like what Aeron Targaryen thought the wildfire would do to him. And the thing is, more and more Targaryens started going insane following the death of the dragons. Prince Elora Targaryen, the daughter of Prince Rhaegal Targaryen, who was himself considered to be insane, went mad with grief after she accidentally killed her twin brother and betrothed Aelor Targaryen. She would end up taking her own life after an incident with three strangers at a mass ball that left both her and her house shamed. Aemon's brother Egg would perish at the tragedy of Summerhall, which the entire fandom thinks was because he pushed his desire to see the dragons too far and ended up paying the price for it with the lives of half of his family. Egg's son, Jaehaerys, who told Baristan Selmy that quote about the Targaryen madness in the first place, could not help it when his own son Ares terrorized the Seven Kingdoms with his madness. So yes, the prophetic powers of a dragon dreamer are very real and very organic, but they are also very dangerous. More often than not, they are misinterpreted by the ones who have them simply because they do not know how to. And even if they do, their warnings are treated with derision in a world 
where logic was rapidly outpacing magic as the chief military weapon. So while Dragon Dreams are arguably the strongest power in the arsenal of a Targaryen, they are also the most dangerous. And that is something that the House of the Dragon wants to convey to the audience through Queen Helena Targaryen. Because in Fire and Blood, there is not a single piece of evidence that marks her out as a dreamer. Your father. There is a beast beneath the boards. Oh, my dearest love. A sweet child who is best suited to become a mother, Helena Targaryen in Fire and Blood. If you read Fire and Blood, then you would probably know that out of all three of Alicent's children, Helena was probably the only one who didn't truly hate her half-sister, Rhaenyra, and was just sort of along for what has to be the worst possible thrill ride of anyone's life. Helena was born in 109 AC, two years after her elder brother, Aegon, and over a decade after Rhaenyra herself. Not much is known about her youth to us except for the fact that she was a plump, less striking than other Targaryens, and sort of simple-minded. By the time she was 11 years old, she had bonded with and was flying the pale blue dragon Dreamfire, who was ridden by Reiner Targaryen before her, and perhaps that should have been our first sign about her eventual fate. Reiner Targaryen arguably endured through more grief than any other Targaryen princess in their entire lifetime. She was a queen to two kings, one the son of the weak king Aeneas, and the other, Maegor the Cruel. She gave birth to two daughters, but by the time she was dead, one of them had passed away, and the others had practically adopted the mother above as her own maternal figure. She was a queen in the west, and then the queen in the east, though she lost her love to the sea and her mother to her lord husband's desire for a child, and by her end she came to reside in Harrenhal the cursed castle of Harren the Black. Rainer had been described as a dreamy child, given to spending time with animals more than humans before she bonded with Dreamfire, and thereafter devolving into a bitter woman who felt cheated out of the joys of life at every turn in the end. Perhaps the fact that Helena bonded with the dragon of such a tragic queen should have forewarned her mother. Alison was seemingly content with turning a blind eye to the history of the house that she'd married into. She wasn't blind to tradition though, because when Helena turned 13, she was married to her elder brother Aegon. Within the year, the couple was blessed with twins in the form of Jaehaerys and Jahira, who both received dragon eggs in their cradle that hatched into the hatchlings of Shrykos and Morgul. Though Helena was seen as a dutiful wife and mother, there was no warmth in their relationship with Aegon, who only seemed to visit her chambers to perform his duty or make a point. In 127 AC, after King Viserys recovered from the illness that was caused by cutting his arm to the bone on the Iron Throne's barbs, a great feast was thrown by him in celebration. Helena and her children were present, and after the king had departed from the festivities, she was asked for a dance by her nephew, Jaehaerys Valerian, to which she acquiesced. This made her husband, Prince Aegon, most wroth, however, as he nearly came to blows with Rhaenyra's eldest. A few months after this feast, Aegon and Helena's third child, Maelor, was born. Prince Maelor was given a dragon's egg in the cradle as well. But unlike his sibling's egg, his did not hatch. On the eve of King Viserys' death, he was visited by his second daughter and all three of his grandchildren. His grace spent his time regaling Jaehaerys, Jaehaera and Maelor with made-up tales of his own grandsire Jaehaerys, the conciliator, fighting wargs, giants and worse, beyond the wall. They would be the last people to see the king in good health, who passed away the next day during a nap. Helena was informed of her father's death a day after it took place, and we are never told how she reacted to it. Though one thing is certain, she did not protest her mother's treason. On the tenth day after King Viserys' passing, his son Aegon was proclaimed king by Criston Kingmaker in the dragon pit of King's Landing. Helena was beside her brother when it happened. She was crowned by her mother, the Dowager Queen Alicent Hightower herself, who gave her daughter her own crown and proclaimed her my queen. Thus began the short and tragic reign of Queen Helena the Kind, who was fondly remembered by the small folk of King's Landing. Unlike her husband and young brother, Aemond, Queen Helena was one of the few people on Aegon's council to propose peace as opposed to war. When Grand Maester Orwell suggested that the Greens send generous terms to Rhaenyra, Helena was amongst his foremost supporters, alongside Alicent. It's more likely that Alicent proposed this suggestion because Orwell's testimony was written to portray him in the best light possible, but Helena's support for it is still of worthy note. It was said that all of Alicent's children hated Rhaenyra and 
and her own children. But here we have proof that this wasn't the case. Queen Helena was amongst the few who actually advocated peace on the side of the Greens, but her views had been rendered moot to the day her brother descended on one of their cousins with Vagar. At Storm's End, Aemon slew Lyceris and Arax and returned to King's Landing to a split response. His mother and grandsire Otto Hightower were horrified. While his brother was so delighted, he threw Aemon a great feast. We're never told what Helena thought of it, but she would probably most likely come to resent her younger brother for the consequences of his actions. After Aegon's coronation, Helena had made it her custom to take her children to her mother's apartment in the Tower of the Hand every evening. Following Lyceris' death, she should have been more protective of herself and her children and at least taken a dozen guards with her wherever she went. Sadly, we don't think that this might have helped her anyway because Helena's biggest tragedy had took place far behind closed doors. On one fateful evening when she took her children to see their grandmother, she was instead met by a gold-cloaked turned butcher and a rat catcher who are only remembered by the histories by their sobriquets. When Helena entered Alicent's chambers, she had three children. After blood and cheese left, she was left with two. Helena Targaryen lost her life that day, for the grief of what she had witnessed drove her to madness. Aegon and his queen slept in separate chambers thenceforth, and Helena would often be found sobbing in a corner and refusing to see her other children, ruminating over her own shortcomings as a mother and a queen. She would die much like her ancestor, Aelora, though her death would come attached with a conspiracy theory as well. As much as we want to break all that down for you right now, we feel that we should leave things where they stand and segue into how all of what we've just said matters in the context of what you're really here for from this video, House of the Dragon. She is a dreamer and a dragon rider, Helena Targaryen in House of the Dragon. The Helena we meet in the House of the Dragon is different. She does not exactly meet the description we get of her from Fire and Blood. She is interested in insects and is handling a millipede in the scene where she is introduced to us, which is not a hobby that we're even made aware of in the books. She's sort of an absent-minded and clearly far removed from whatever politics her mother and brothers are cooking up, which sort of aligns her with being called simple-minded in the books, although that is debatable. She's flying dream fire more than we hear her doing, so that's a good thing. And oh my god, why is she suddenly patch face from the main series? Someone please make this stop, please. Helena Targaryen being a dragon dreamer is something that is show exclusive, we are sure, and yet it makes perfect sense. She can instantly tell that Aemond was in the dragon pit trying to claim one of the adult dragons, because the dragon he sneaked up on was her own dragon, Dreamfire. When Aemond insists on wanting a dragon and Alicent comforts her, Helena matter-of-factly states that he will have to lose an eye, which he does in the very next episode. When Helena visits Driftmark for Helena Valerian's funeral, she spits out a prophecy that foreshadows the Dance of the Dragons, and we're pretty sure we know who the beast beneath the boards is that is terrifying her for the rest of the season. But here's the thing, none of this is intimated to us in Fire and Blood, because Helena herself was never seen as a priority. It's possible that the Queen was a dragon dreamer in Martin original creation as well, but it seems unlikely. What seems to be happening here is that we proposed in our explanation of Dragon Dreamers at the start of the video, they are setting you up for the Mad Queen Helena. If you have seen our video explaining the Beast Beneath the Board's prophecy, which you really should if you haven't, then you will know what is coming for Helena and her children in Season 2. The fact that she has to witness something this horrifying is enough to break anyone's mind. Alison was also present there and she made it out of the ordeal relatively sane, though what becomes highly questionable towards the end of her life. Why did Helena descend into madness so quickly that she couldn't even ride Dreamfire anymore? Could this be because she had foreseen it years ago and yet was powerless to do anything about it because of her simplicity? That seems to be the answer that House of the Dragon is edging towards, and personally we think it is a good one. Prophecy and prophetic powers have often been portrayed as a double-edged blade in Martin's works. Those who are blessed with those gifts are often either too weak to wield them or too iron-willed to be relenting in their pursuits. Helena clearly falls in the former category, as even doing something so simple as dancing properly with Gisarus is enough to elicit claps from her grandfather, indicating just how low their expectations are from her. Helena is sheltered because she is misunderstood, not because people understand her prophetic powers, which could have been different had she been married to Jace instead. That is also something that is show exclusive, by the way, because in Fire and Blood, Gisarus and Helena being married to each other was never a thought. Jace was born in the same year that Alicent's youngest son, Daeron, was, and by the time he was old enough for betrothal, Helena had been married to Aegon. By 
proposing a match between Jace and Helena, the show gives you the perfect what-if scenario, where Rhaenyra and Alicent's families actually unite behind their future king and queen. Instead, Alicent betrothes Helena to Aegon and scoffs at the very thought of wedding her daughter to a bastard. This is the same Alicent who has practically turned the Red Keep into a sept, and whose faith denounces incest as a grave sin, the doctrine of exceptionalism aside. So you can see Helena emerge as a symbol, not only of ignorance, but also of how a severe lack of empathy and willingness to cooperate can destroy a family from within. Her prophetic powers are arguably more important than any number of dragons Damon can find in his favourite hangout spot, and yet she is ignored. If only people had actually paid attention to what she was saying, asked her why she was saying these things, maybe everything that ends up happening in season one could have been avoided. But that is the point that House of the Dragon is making with her character. Ignoring Helena will lead to one of the show's darkest moments, and she has the potential to outclass Daenerys as a Mad Queen figure if we're strictly talking about Games of Thrones here. Helena Targaryen has been taken from a secondary player to almost like this harbouring of doom for the entire show, which is fitting because that is a recurring theme in George R. R. Martin's major stories. A Song of Ice and Fire has multiple characters who experience prophetic visions and dreams, and a few solid green seers, as well as in the form of Bran, a uh, Blood Raven, and the Ghost of High Heart. Because Fire and Blood is a fictional history of the first half of Targaryen ruling Westeros, it is entirely possible that details could have revealed Helena's powers simply slipped through the fingers of Archmaester Gardaen. But that has only made the House of the Dragon that much more immersive, and we cannot wait to see how Fear Saban plays Helena going forward. Dragons, the flesh, weaving dragons of thread. Marvellous Verdict Queen Helena Targaryen is the classic example of the casualties of the Game of Thrones that the High Lords play. In Season 1, Ned Stark tried to play the game with honour and ended up losing his life and starting a war that tore the Seven Kingdoms apart. Doran Martell is still unaware of the fact that his son, Quintin, has died in a mad attempt to tame dragons because he wants to believe in the fire and blood promised to him for Elia's death all those years ago. Helena Targaryen is someone who has been put into the position she is in by duty more than choice and it's downright tragic that she is the one who will show you just how unfair or fair if your team black through and through war can be she was loved by the people and the courts of both sides of the civil war and her death started a riot that brought down a queen raised three kings and put an end to the dragons themselves queen helena targaryen was kind good and stricken by grief towards her end and we shall never see her light again and that brings us to the end of our marvelous video so and if you liked our content don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already have a good one and be safe thanks everyone your father there is a beast beneath the boards oh my dear